Well, we're now at the, uh, the, the last section, and you're still here. <laughs> it's like amazing. You came back. What I'm going to try to do um, is, first of all, keep time and make sure that I'm on time. So what I'm going to try to do is cover bipolar depression, and I'm going to try to do this in three acts. Uh, the, the, the first act will be a little bit more on the brain and my wonder about the brain. Uh, the second thing will be a little bit on bipolar depression itself. And then the third, which I'll try to spend the most time on, is not only the currently available treatments, but some of the things that look like they're potential future treatments and things that we're actually studying. So to be able to share that with you. So first, um, you know, Hippocrates was, was quite wise. And it, it, we've said it, several people have said it during the day about how important our brains are. But we tend to all live without an awareness of what it's doing. It, you don't feel it. You don't know it's doing its job. Uh, and, and we assume that it's there, right, doing, doing something good. But everything really comes from it. So what I'm going to take you through is a very quick journey and really quite remarkable pictures that I think will stun you. And then I will tell you a, an odd set of facts at the end of this. So this is what we first used to think. I right? used to think that the phrenologists knew what they were doing and that there were different areas of your head that were related to the bumps on your skull, related to certain functions, and that was that. Then we started to actually look at what the brain was and divided it up into these anatomical areas and, and also said, well, maybe this area does that and this area does this uh, and this other area does that. Then we started to be able to look inside with functional magnetic resonance and all these other interesting imaging studies and also starting to look at what's the organization of it, except that this is very gross. This is really just kind of telling you these large structures and not quite the structures that underlie this structure. And now it looks like this. Um, if you want to see something really cool, um, look up brainbow. Brainbow, like rainbow with a B. Uh, and I'll show you what that looks like in a moment. But it turns out that our brains are organized into sheets. And the sheets of cells are really quite remarkable. This shows some of the pathways of those sheets. And the sheets are organized, this is going to blow your mind, but they're, they're perpendicular to each other in right angles. Right? And, and so when, it, when our brains grow, they grow in a very organized way that is so astounding that you could have one cell from the other side of the room know where it has to go all the way to the other side of the room. How does it know to get there? But you end up making all of these connections that are stunning. And the growth of our brains are stunning. And we're still trying to understand what are all the signals that allows our brains to self-organize into the amazing thing that we carry around all the time. All right, this is a top-down view. So you can get a little sense of what those sheets are like uh, of all of the cells that, that are so highly organized. If you get a little closer, you see there's even an incredible microarchitecture that happens on a very, very tiny level, uh, which is also extraordinary. And this is the brainbow. So the, the brainbow is made up of individual cells that you can actually make it so that they're colored differently, they fluoresce differently. And, and what you can see is that there's this really amazing organization and relationship between the cells, but it's even more than that. It's unbelievably dense. And so this is a picture of one, one uh, axon and all of the cells and connections around it. And within a nanometer, there are so many connections that people are still trying to figure it out. Right? So, so it's, it's just extraordinary. Now, here, here's the the thing that'll blow your mind. If you listened very carefully when Janet Wozniak talked, uh, when, when she spoke earlier, 
Uh, she used a, an odd word. And I have to apologize for all of us because we swim in this land of other things. And when we try to share it with you, sometimes we might use terms that are not clear to you. But that's our fault, right? We're not explaining it. And, and if you listen very carefully, Janet Wozniak, she used a, an odd word in development. She used the word pruning. Anybody catch that? Does anybody know what that is? Right? So, so some people might, but some people don't. Our brains are not wired like an electrical thing, right? Where you made the wires and that's it, and your wires talk to each other. That's not the way it works. Our brains are changing all the time, and our brains are highly dynamic. There are connections made and broken all the time. That's going on in our heads now. There are cells in our heads called microglia that eat synapses, that eat your synapses. They actually test your synapse. They, they say, eat me or not eat me. There's a very complex signal there. And either it'll, it'll engulf it and pinch it off, or it won't. It'll make the decision based on a very complicated set of, of uh, chemical signals and how much you're using. If you don't use it, you lose it. All right, if you're not using a connection, it gets pruned like you're pruning a tree. And the cells wander around in your head, in our heads, the microglia, and they eat your synapses. All right? If you want to see a wild video of it, uh, Google Beth Stevens, and you'll see a whole bunch of lectures from Beth Stevens on how she discovered this and how she found this, and that's amazing. That's number one. Number two is that we have neuronal stem cells in our head. And the neuronal, the neuronal, neuronal stem cells will not only develop from, can be any type of cell in your head to maybe a neuron, but they'll wander around, right? So you make new ones in the hippocampus. They wander around and they make new connections. So you're making new connections, breaking them, pruning them. It's an incredibly dynamic, energy-intensive uh, uh, phenomenon. So we have our, our uh, what the term for this is neuroplasticity, right? And the neuroplasticity is that, uh, that our brains are flexible, adaptive, changing, and dynamic. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> so what's kids <laughs> Right. So, so, so again, just, this is what's going on. It's a very complicated process. It's governed by a lot of genes. Uh, and, and again, it doesn't take a lot for it to go awry. It takes a lot for it to work in the way it's supposed to work. Um, but it's one of the reasons that, that we're so adaptive in many ways, because we are capable of learning. And when you learn something, you're changing the structure of your brain. All right? So uh, you've heard a little bit about sleep, right? And, and sleep is a big part of bipolar disorder. And good sleep helps that whole process, right? Bad sleep can, can uh, buffer it down. Also, stress will, will suppress the making of new neurons. And every antidepressant will promote it. Every antidepressant, no matter how they work, they promote new neurons to grow. So, so you've got this going on in the background all the time. All right, so that's act one, just to to give you a flavor of, of the complexity and what's going on. Act two, you've heard about bipolar disorder. I'm not going to belabor these particular facts. Um, what I do want to tell you, oh, anybody see these movies? What, good, bad, OK, half OK, good enough. So um, uh, I'm in Kissed by God if you haven't seen it. So I'm like the expert in Kissed by God. It's a, I thought they'd put me in for 30 seconds. They put me in for at least 45 seconds. So, you, so I'm like a movie star now. You can look at Kissed by God. It, um, it, it's really actually a very good documentary of Andy Irons, who was the number one surfer in the world and had bipolar disorder and substance abuse disorder, probably died from substance abuse. Um, and it's his whole journey and, and what happened. It's, it's a very good documentary. This look familiar in terms of ups and downs and the course of what can happen. 
Uh, th this, uh, this spaghetti plot is actually a little inaccurate because it, Every line is supposed to represent an individual, but actually individuals can be on multiple lines. And you heard this alluded to a little bit by other people. And, and let me make it explicit. Depression is not the opposite of mania. Mania is not the opposite of depression. Most people who have bipolar depression will have manic symptoms. Most people who have mania will have depressive symptoms. It's what's predominant that will define the episode. The other thing that you've heard repeatedly, both from the panel and from other people, is anxiety. And this will stun you, but anxiety has barely been studied in bipolar disorder. This controversy about the use of benzodiazepines, some people think it helps, some people think it doesn't help. Um, to my knowledge, there are only four studies in the literature on treating the anxiety associated with bipolar disorder. When people get sick, when people have an episode, when they're feeling horrible, when they're spending time in an illness state, the vast majority of the illness state is in depression for most people on average. For people who have bipolar one with a history of mania, they can spend about a third of their time depressed if not treated. With people who have bipolar II who have hypomania but never mania, they can spend up to half of their time with depressive symptoms. So it is the major burden of the disorder for many people. You mix in mania and you have mixed states along with anxiety and substance abuse and other things that, that can happen and it just makes things that much harder to deal with. Any questions about that so far? OK. Act three, treatments. So there is good news and bad news. The good news is that there are treatments. They're evidence-based, they're FDA approved, and they can work frequently but not frequently enough. So the, the ones that are FDA approved is there's something called the olanzapine fluoxetine combination that's a combination of Zyprexa plus Prozac. It was actually the first treatment that was approved for bipolar depression. What is remarkable about the olanzapine fluoxetine combination is that in the clinical trials, it works in about 60% of people compared to placebo, which works in about 30% of people in acute studies. And very few people prescribe this. And the reason that very few people prescribe this is because the olanzapine has such a burden of what's called metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome is increased weight, increased blood pressure, abnormal lipids, and a risk for diabetes. Right? That's what the metabolic syndrome is. Weight gain, increased blood pressure, abnormal lipids, and pre-diabetic, or people can become diabetic. That burden is such a burden with olanzapine, people don't like to take it, and prescribers don't like to prescribe it. The problem is it works really well. And sometimes it works when other things don't work and some people have to take it. In the future and the near future, the good news is there's a company that is putting something together with olanzapine that will almost wipe out the metabolic syndrome. It'll prevent it, right? And the, and the name of the drug that they're using to prevent it is called Samidorphin, uh, which is not yet available but they're gonna make that combination. So this may be more reasonable in the future because we really understand that, that, that you know, the burden is terrible. All, all you need on top of what you have to take is something that's gonna give you metabolic syndrome. Right? That's not a present that you ask for. The next one is catiapine or Seroquel. What is remarkable about Seroquel, catiapine, it's good for anything that bothers you. 
doesn't matter. It, it's good for, for insomnia. It's good for anxiety. It's good for psychosis. It's good for mania. It's good for bipolar depression. Um, it, too, however, has the burden of the metabolic syndrome, less so than olanzapine, but still the risk is there. Uh, it, it is a very popular drug for people to prescribe. Right? Helps people sleep, feel less anxious, function better, not become manic, and it does treat the depression. Here, too, in the clinical trials, it helps in about 50% compared to placebo, which is about 30%. Right, so it's better than placebo acutely. The third thing, lorazidone or Latuda, is one of the newer ones in this class. By the way, all of these also function as antipsychotic agents. They also function as antimatic agents, except for the Latuda, lorazidone. They're actually, I don't even think there are studies of it using for mania. Do you know, Masood? I don't even know if they've done studies on it. But, but it, you know, this too, it's, it's the same story where in the clinical trials, works in about a half to two thirds compared to placebo, about a third. And it has much less of a risk of the metabolic syndrome and is one of the things that its, its advantage is. Uh, the last one on that, the, the fourth one on the list is cariprazine or Vralar, which just recently got approved. Um, that also works for mania, for psychosis, and it's a similar story. Works in about a half to 60% compared to placebo, about 30%, lo a lower risk of the metabolic syndrome. Now, in parentheses, I put lamotrigine, which is lamictal. You heard a little bit about it earlier. Um, you heard uh, Masood talk about that a little bit earlier. What is remarkable about, about Lamictal is uh, docs like to prescribe it, patients like to take it. There's one very bad side effect that can occur. I'll tell you about that in a moment. The clinical trials, there have been five clinical trials. One showed that it worked for bipolar depression. The other five, it could not distinguish itself from placebo. So the company did not pursue it as an acute treatment. Now, those were monotherapy studies. And there's a problem with Lamictal. And this gets into the side effect that I'll tell you about and why the trials probably didn't find that it was useful. There's a very, very bad and dangerous skin reaction called Stevens-Johnson syndrome, or toxic epidermal necrosis which can be fatal. And in the use of the drug over the years, because it's actually an anticonvulsant, there's a certain proportion of people who would have this terrible, devastating reaction. You get these uh, rash with blisters that, that can basically be like a, a fourth, fifth degree burn. Are there fifth degree burns? One, two, three, third, third degree burns, right? But, but um, uh, the way that, that you mitigate, the way that you lower or virtually eliminate that risk is to start low and go up really slow. That's why people will start on 25 milligrams and increase by 25 milligrams per week to try to get to an initial target dose of 200. How do you do a study? When do you start a clock if it takes eight weeks to get up to the full dose? Right? And that's part of the problem of the thing. So it turns out that, that if you mix it with lithium, that there's a very good study that was done where lamotrigine plus lithium versus placebo plus lithium, lamotrigine plus lithium worked for acute bipolar depression. And so most people will mix this in with something else. So, so the other nice thing, and otherwise it doesn't have a lot of side effects. Right? Otherwise people tolerate it really pretty well. So, so it's a very popular drug. Um, towards the end of October, I am debating a colleague at a meeting in New York about the usefulness or lack thereof of antidepressants. And this is a complicated story. But the simple part of the story is that there is not 
one single placebo-controlled trial of antidepressants for bipolar depression that showed that antidepressants are better than placebo. Not one. The most common treatment worldwide for bipolar depression is giving an antidepressant. Why? Well, you have a depression, you take an antidepressant, right? But, but there's no data that actually supports that. And certainly for a subpopulation of people, it can make them manic. For other people, it may not make that much of a difference. But here's the complication. Here's, here's the interesting part. Remember I told you that there are no studies or very few of anxiety in bipolar disorder? Sometimes the antidepressants treat the anxiety, right? So sometimes it, help, it helps dampen that down in, in a reasonable way. So people will prescribe it for the people who aren't activated by it, who don't become manic, and sometimes that can be useful. Nevertheless, there's still a myth among clinicians, maybe it works. You have bipolar depression, you give an antidepressant, right? But there's, there's just, it's an amazing lack of data. So in the debate, I am taking the, the against the use of, of antidepressant part of that. Electroconvulsive therapy is probably underused. There are data that for people who are really difficult to treat, it actually beats the best guideline pharmacotherapy that you can come up with. The, the, the uh, challenge is that if somebody responds to ECT, what do you do? And what some people do is maintenance ECT to maintain it. And that's sort of a, you give as much as somebody needs. You, you end up, if somebody responds to electroconvulsive therapy who has bipolar depression, you give them a, an acute course, which is maybe six to 12 treatments given at a frequency of three times per week. And then you see how long you can get away with without giving it, one week, two weeks, four weeks, that sort of thing. It's actually the same with, uh, with repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation. It's done clinically. It is not approved for bipolar depression. Uh, there's a company that's trying to get approval for it to be able to do the studies. My friends who really are experts in, in, in the RTMS, the repetitive transcranial magnetic, magnetic stimulation, tell me they think that it works better in bipolar depression than in unipolar depression. But there really aren't any studies that, that show that. But that's their clinical experience. So that's sort of the first four are FDA approved, the next four, the next few are not, right? This is the entire universe of treatments for bipolar depression, even though it's the greatest burden on average for people with bipolar disorder. I already told you about lamotrigine, antidepressants, and these things. These are not, it's one of the problems with RTMS is that sometimes the insurance companies will balk or, or they won't approve it because they say it's only approved for unipolar depression, which is kind of ridiculous, uh, but that's the way it is. These can really help. You heard from Doug Katz earlier. Uh, what Doug didn't quite emphasize is that if someone's on a mood stabilizer that prevents them from getting manic, these are really important adjuncts for the acute bipolar depressive episode. They really can help a lot. And, and I'm, I'm not trying to sell these books that we've sort of done. I'm just trying to show them to you. So here, here's where it gets interesting. Right? What's the cutting edge? What are we trying to do? How can we move forward to try to get to better treatments? Um, has anybody heard of ketamine? Right? So, so ketamine has, has been in the news, and it was recently, a form of it was approved uh, called S-ketamine, which is just one particular form of it. Um, it. It sounds like it's the new kid on the block, and it just came out. It's actually been studied for 20 years. Um, and it's used for treatment-resistant depression, um, and people will use it for also bipolar depression. 
the, the good news is that even one uh, or two or three uh, administrations of it, and it's complicated how to do it. The one that's approved is S-ketamine, which is intranasal. The one that's off-label is ketamine, which is intravenous. There are ketamine clinics all over the place that, for reasons beyond me, charge an enormous amount of money uh, for each infusion. Ketamine is dirt cheap, and S-ketamine is actually expensive. It's, believe it or not, it's an old anesthetic, right? And so it's been used as an anesthetic for a long time. Um, but people are very excited because ketamine is a different mechanism of action of all of, compared to all of the other things that I told you about. Um, the, the next two, the PO glitazone and the basafibrate, are repurposed drugs that they affect a particular pathway, which, which, which uh, I won't get into. But what's remarkable is that PO glitazone is an anti-diabetic drug. Basafibrate, which we're studying, so we have an active study if anybody's interested, is actually an anti-triglyceride drug. Um, basic science and some other things, these drugs are what's called neuroprotective. In other words, they protect neurons from bad things happening to them. And again, there's a particular protective pathway that it hits, which, which again, I just won't get into at the moment. The other one on, on the list is really rather surprising. And that is it's an antibiotic, minocycline. And it turns out that minocycline has some similar properties to ketamine, except minocycline is an antibiotic that's been around forever that some people take chronically for acne. So we know that people can take it long term, that it's safe, uh, that it's reasonable to do. But a lot of people in the brain sciences are looking at minocycline as actually a very benign long-term treatment for a lot of brain-based disorders. Uh, so that's particularly interesting. And the other thing is that there is a semi-natural substance that you could buy at Whole Foods called N-acetylcysteine, or NAC. Now, NAC has been studied in just a few places, but here is the remarkable story about NAC, because it also does some things similar to ketamine, but in a very gentle sort of Rube Goldberg way, if you, if you know about Rube Goldberg. Does anybody know about Rube Goldberg? If you never, uh, for those of you who never heard Rube Goldberg, look it up on the internet. Because Rube Goldberg used to draw these cartoons of these contraptions that were incredibly complicated to do something simple, like blow out a candle. You know, you'd have to have a rooster run over and get a bowling ball to roll down to, you know, make a lever go. So, so it's kind of a Rube Goldberg way of, of very gently affecting the same system that ketamine hits. And here's what's really interesting. N-acetylcysteine has been studied acutely in traumatic brain injury. And it looks like it actually prevents bad things from happening if you hit your head. But it has to be given quickly after that. So it can protect the neurons from all sorts of things because it has a very powerful anti-inflammatory effect. It's one of the components of the strongest anti-inflammatory drug that we make in our brains called glutathione. And here's the other interesting story that buried in the literature, there's a study of um, traumatic brain injury in mice. So you bop the mice on the head and you see what happens. It sounds terrible, but they, you know, they're trying to study it. The combination of minocycline plus NAC is better than either one alone. Um, so we have a study of that for people with bipolar depression. And, and clinically, sometimes maybe it helps, but we're willing to test it and put it to the test. Um, Pramipexol is a drug that we have stolen from the Parkinson's people. Um, and that also looks reasonably positive, although there's limited studies of that. There's a, an interesting substance that you can buy called nicotinamide riboside that has to do with brain energy metabolism. Um, there's actually a company that mixes it with something else that, 
they claim it will prevent you from aging. So some people like that. Not a lot of data, but you know, people will sometimes buy this stuff. It'll prevent you from aging. Like that, that's not so bad. Um, and then there's another interesting uh, uh, blood pressure drug, uh, candesartan, and that may also have some role. Um, and we might we might study that. So so there are a lot of research opportunities. The other thing, let me shut this off. Can I shut this off? How do I shut that off? There we go. Um, uh, we're also, we just started a study of xenon, which is a gas, and it's kind of like ketamine. Uh, it took us 10 years to try to develop it, three years to get through the FDA and build a machine, but you breathe it. So we just started a study of, of xenon for bipolar depression. Uh, we have another study of something called near-infrared light, which is another interesting way to very gently impact brain energy metabolism. And then we have some studies in the pipeline uh, with something called pimivanserin, which is approved only for the treatment of psychosis in Parkinson's. But what's interesting about pimivanserin, so it, you, it acts as an antipsychotic, but it does not have the same mechanism of action of any other antipsychotic. So all of the so-called antipsychotics that are repurposed for bipolar disorder block dopamine, pimivanserin does not. And we think that it might be useful because it doesn't dull people, right? So, so uh, that's one thing. And the final thing is, is um, we're submitting a study to study Epsilon. And the a remarkable thing about Epsilon, it's being studied for hearing loss, but it might mimic lithium without the problems. So there's a group in Oxford that is looking at it, and we might be able to look at it also. So look, we have to have a better understanding of bipolar disorder. There are now about 60 genes that have been implicated. Um, does it, you know, it's informative, but it's just the beginning to try to understand what's going on with the brain. Um, we have another sort of thing where, believe it or not, you can turn skin cells into little teeny brains, brain organoids. We want to see if we can do clinical trials, see what happens to people and their brain organoids. That's a whole other thing. People are looking at big data to try to get at clues. Um, we're going to try to put together a study to have a massive study of how people do over time globally. That's in the, the pipeline. And we continue to pursue philanthropic support to be able to do the research that really matters to people. Thank you so much for being here, uh, for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions you have. Hi, um, thank you so much for all the work you've done and you've been very powerful in helping me today. My question is, it's taken me about two and a half years to get stable with my bipolar and I'm so afraid that all of a sudden I'm going to wake up crazy again. And I mean crazy, just out of my mind, depression. I don't really have the mania, but I have the depression. In your experience, have you seen people who stay in remission for years and years and years and years, providing they follow their meds and all that other good stuff? Yes. Thanks. Good. <laughs> Good yeah. to know. It, it's, actually, it, it's actually one of the reasons that we want to do this, this uh, um, project of the bipolar global cohort. People have different trajectories, and, and it's quite remarkable. There are some people who really struggle all the time. There are other people who just completely thrive and, and do fine. Uh, and then there are people who kind of bounce around in the, in the middle. We want to understand what's the biology of that? What, what differentiates that? But there are certainly people who can respond to treatment and sustain it. Hi, I have a question over here. So when you were talking about the olanzapine and fluoxetine combination, I feel like it's contradictory because you were talking about how very often people with the bipolar, my son has the manic piece, the, um, he's very, very sensitive to SSRIs. So I think in the past when he's had that combined with lithium and some other mood stabilizer, he still becomes manic. But he has very severe depression with suicidal acts and ideation. So does that work only for some of the, um, some people, the, the combination? 
What's remarkable with the lanzapine fluoxetine combination, it does not seem to provoke mania. Really? Um, oddly enough, there, there's something about that combination. Uh, and and the, the company that made it years ago, and I think now it's generic, but the, um, uh, the, there's some interesting biology of what happens when you mix those two things together. It goes a little against what I said earlier, the antidepressants don't work, except if you combine it with a lanzapine, the data show that it works. So might be helpful. Hi. Um, a number of years ago, I read a study. Where, where's, the, where's the person? Oh, hello. Hi. That was done um, at the Veterans Hospital, and it was with a number of veterans who had PTSD, and it was to help them to decrease in smoking. And after being given, I think it was 2,400 milligrams of the N-acetylcysteine, uh, a large percentage of them were successful in quitting smoking. After that, I read another study that was done with teenagers who had problems uh, from whatever reason, I don't know if it was PTSD or not, who were marijuana dependent, and again, a large number of them were successful in decreasing their marijuana use using the N-acetylcysteine. So I'm wondering if you could speak to this aspect. Yeah, so, so, so um, did everybody hear that? No. Uh, some people did not. The, the, there's, um, so N-acetylcysteine has been shown to work to treat smoking, marijuana use, cocaine abuse, gambling, hair pulling, autism, cognitive problems in schizophrenia, and bipolar disorder. All right, there, there, there's some rigorous research that have shown at least there's a signal that it works in those things. The, the reason I'm telling you this is because the National Institute of Mental Health has refused to study anything about N-acetylcysteine. And their rationale is, well, it hits too many targets, so we won't learn anything. Yes. So a man FDA approved lamotrigine works. Mike, Mike. Yeah, a man FDA approved lamotrigine works slowly. So among the among the FDA approved treatments, lamotrigine is not approved for the acute treatment of depression, bipolar depression. It's approved for the prevention of bipolar depression, not for the acute treatment. But that's how doctors prescribe it anyway, because it probably does work. OK, but in combination with quetiapine? Usually in combination with something else, usually, yeah. Hello, question back here. Um, I guess to kind of, uh, follow up on that question, uh, do you have any research studies that um, look at uh, family members that are predispositioned genetically to bipolar and how to prevent things, specifically for women, in uh, my understanding, who often have their first episode during their first pregnancy and things like this? And in general, um, what is your hope for the next 20 years of um, this kind of medicine if the climate doesn't annihilate us all? So, so if, if, if I heard you correctly, um, uh, the, the last part of the question is what's going to happen in 20 years? Or did I hear you correctly? Yes, uh, just in, in all the research uh, projects that you're talking about in the different treatments, medicine, uh, is there uh, hope for um, B better cures, better treatment, better results, and things like this. Yeah, so, so I, I, I do want to leave you with, with a lot of hope. Um, the, the, the neurosciences are advancing rapidly, even though I showed you how complicated the systems are. Uh, the the um, trying to understand the pathophysiology, what is dysregulated in the biology, is expanding every year. And I would suspect that in 20 years, if not sooner, we'll have some better idea to be able to understand the biology and match treatments to individuals' biology. That's what my hope is over the next 20 years, and we hope to be part of that whole thing. And now I've completely forgotten the first part of your question. <laughs> Yeah, so, so people who are at risk, uh, uh, people who are at, at high risk, um, uh, you also heard, you heard Janet talk about first degree relatives. Well, first degree relatives are your parents and your siblings, 
right? So, so, so there's only one degree between you. Um, and because it's heritable and genetic, those people who have a first degree family member are at higher risk. Um, there are studies that are, try that are going on now to understand what happens to the high risk people. And Janet is doing some fundamental work of using things like N-acetylcysteine or omega-3 fatty acids to see if there's some dysregulation that happens early on, can you then intervene and either prevent it or at least delay it? Okay. I, I had been doing some uh, research on um, bioneurofeedback, and um, this has to do apparently with ADHD and um, traumatic brain injuries, and now I have a friend who's, who had her adult daughter treated for bipolar, and it was very successful from a perspective of um, brain image, imagery and then um, stimulating or pruning certain neurons that seem to be doing the wrong thing. And I wondered if you could comment on what you think about that um, therapy and, and what you might know about it. So I, I don't know anything about it. It sounds very interesting. Uh, and, and love to see data on that. I think we have time for one or two more. Yes. So. Beyond medication, uh, would you recommend, I don't know, maybe food or something like that? I, I read something about omega-3 or maybe food to avoid for depression. Yeah, so, so I have a very good colleague in Australia, and her name is Felice Jacka, and she runs the Food and Mood Center. And, and uh, Felice is a very rigorous scientist who is looking at diet and other, and, and microbiome and that sort of, um, area, and, and the one thing I'm taking away from her research and others' research is um, something that Michael Pollan talks about, which is eat real food. Eat food your grandparents would recognize. Avoid processed food. If you can avoid virtually all processed food, it probably decreases the inflammatory load, is probably good for you. Um, if you look at something called the DASH diet, that's probably pretty good. The Mediterranean diet is also pretty good. Uh, you know, the main thing is, is to eat real food and not too much of it. Um, Lu Louisa Sylvia is our expert in trying to help people change their eating behavior. It is not easy, you know, because one of the things that, that is also related to Doug Katz's presentation is if we are mindless and not mindful, we tend to do stress eating. And we tend to eat a lot of bad things, a little too much of it. So if you can eat, if you can shop, cook, and eat mindfully, and eat the right things a little better, you know, real foods, real grains, n minimize the processed foods, you're probably better off. I think we have one more question. I have a question, but I would like to build on what you just said. Um, I have a son who is uh, 21, and he has a schizophrenia, but also uh, take medication for bipolar, so he has a combination of both. And I noticed that um, based on what he eats, I can predict his behavior. If he eats pizza, hamburgers, any fries, anything that has ketchup, uh, cheese, comfort food, Two days, totally take me three days to, to stabilize him. I can see right away bad behavior, um, in very, a lot of anxiety. So he has a, a tremendous relationship with what he eats. Yeah. So um, I have made a lot of changes for him, um, different habits. But I also um, notice that when he drinks soda, it's the same effect. So I don't know if that happens to everyone. Um, now my question is on regard to ne neuroplasticity. Uh, I feel like I'm running against time because he's 21. He developed this um, illness when he was in his 11 years old, 10 years old. And um, I'm trying to maximize his potential, his brain potential. And I don't know how how long do I have now. He's 21. How how far the neuroplasticity can be in a in an individual? So, so there are a lot of people who have bipolar disorder where if the bipolar disorder is reasonably controlled, they just continue to develop. Um, and that there are some people where 
over a long period of time, they might have a harder time with their ability to think. But, but there's also a lot of controversy about that. It's certainly not everybody, but there's probably a subpopulation who do have a hard time. Other people don't. But one of the things that's highly neuroprotective and may help with brain function over time is lithium. Might be helpful. So I, I thank you so much for, for staying. We are out of time. Um, I, I want to thank you all for, for coming here, all of my colleagues, all of the staff who's helped with this, the development office. The research coordinators and everybody else to, to make this happen. And it really is our privilege here to be able to serve you by giving you the best information possible. So thank you so much.